Well, I um, I want to share with you today uh, my experience with the reconstruction of Puerto Rico and especially the farming systems after Hurricane Maria. This happened in September 2017, and uh, I've titled my I've put as a title for my presentation agroecological resilience, which is also an idea for a research project, which I will talk in the uh, in the last part of my presentation today. Um, before I continue, I would like to present myself. My name is George Felix. I earned a PhD last year in at Wageningen University on production ecology and resource conservation, basically agroecology in West Africa. I was doing field work in West Africa in Burkina Faso. Before that, I had a, a master in agricultural engineering and tropical agroforestry in France. And before that, a BS in biology and environmental sciences in, in France as well. So I'm French Puerto Rican, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. Uh, I, I came back to Puerto Rico to be a lecturer in agroecology and agroforestry at the University of Puerto Rico at Utuado in the mountains. And that's where I'm working at the moment. And I will soon join CORE as an assistant professor in stabilization agriculture. So with Julia, Lillian, and, and Georgina. Puerto Rico has been uh, described as, a, as an oasis for, for food, for farming. You know? Before the disaster, like in 18, before, I mean, 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago, 1898, when we passed from Spanish to US colony, uh, this explorer, Robert Hill, described Puerto Rico as, as uh, essentially the land of the farmer and uh, with a lot of fruits, with a lot of diversity. And he described these, these islands, especially Puerto Rico, as a, as a vast oasis for, for food sovereignty, really, in, in, in the Caribbean. Uh, and, and, and still, there were disasters. So this was a year after that exploration, 1899. There was uh, one of the biggest hurricanes recorded for the island. Uh, San Siriaco, the name, and you see that even the flourishing agriculture, even even in a hundred years ago, there were there was there were perturbations, no natural disasters, and and these are some of the images of the effects. So you can imagine that a hurricane destroys really everything in its uh, in its way, um, uh, especially housing and particularly, of course, all the the crop crop uh, varieties. Uh, but the disaster in Puerto Rico started a long time ago. I mean, even though Robert Hill wrote about us that we had a flourishing agriculture, these are the official, let's say, uh, or official statistics from the FAO, where you see from 1960 to, to present day, the production of, of different food items. The funny story here, or not so funny, is that our basic food, uh, staple food is rice and beans, quite typical in the Caribbean, but nowhere to be found in, the, in our agricultural farms. So this one is for rice and this one is for beans. And uh, since the 1980s, uh, we rarely see any uh, harvest of either of those products, which is uh, quite um uh, frustrating uh, especially given the history that we had in in the past so i want to share not only the you know the the bad things but also the 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 great ones these are some of the farmers that despite the fact the fact that our food system and our economy has shifted from manufacture from uh, agricultural to manufacturing we still have some, some farmers, and these are three examples across the island, uh, that are resisting the changes and are producing food for, for local communities, very rarely for export. To speak about Puerto Rico, we need to understand what the political menace is and what, what it means to be uh, in, this, in this region of the world. And, and I 
I uh, sadly tend to to show Puerto Rico as a showcase or to speak about Puerto Rico as a showcase for vulnerability. Uh, you may know that the Caribbean is divided in uh, how many 26 between 26 and 31 states, no, depending if it's an island or a, or considered a state. Are we still here? I don't hear anybody. So. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Oh, great, great. I don't hear anything, so I was. Yeah, I'm here. We, 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 uh, great. It's because all mics, uh, mics are disabled to to. Oh, to that's great. That's great. Sound. Mm. Okay, just let me know if something is not clear or something, please. Sure. So could, in the you, could you at the bottom at the bottom of uh, your screen is is the Microsoft Teams? Ah, yeah, it's gone now. Thanks. All right. <laughs> so in the Caribbean, you know, we have a a bunch of islands. Uh, we have between 26 and 31 flags, so that means more or less nations. There are more islands than flags, of course, very small ones. And this area is very prone to, to different uh, extreme events, no? climatic extreme events. So from drought to floods to hurricanes, which are the most, uh, the most uh, problematic. Uh, in this graph, you can see the amount of, of extreme climate events in this region and there are many, right? Like I said, the particular case of Puerto Rico is, uh, is one of transformation from agricultural economies to manufacturing, which means in the graph uh, here above that rural population basically shifted to urban. Um, there was a, a strong rural to urban migration in the 1950s, 60s, with the development of these uh, manufacturing economies, industrial economies, and also migration from the island to the, to the United States. Uh, and you might know uh, Puerto Rican communities in New York, uh, which have been historically very important and, and very present in the United States uh, cultural scene. And then you had uh, simultaneously a shift from uh, agricultural areas to reforestation, and this might seem like a, like an interesting, like a, let's say, um, ecologically sound situation, but the reality is that it was an abandonment of agricultural areas and the forest basically re re regained place, but there was no effort in reforestation. So uh, Puerto Rico is often used as an example for the ecological transition theory and I think it's worth the while to contextualize the, the ecological aspects into the political and more social events that happen, that made this reforestation happen. And then comes the hurricane, which basically destroyed the infrastructure, Hurricane Maria, and, uh, and made us rethink how how uh, the dependency and the, the control that we have on our own uh, resources and the, the non-control that we have over the natural phenomena can have on our economy and our well-being. If we've heard about disaster capitalism, Naomi Klein is the, is the author of this and she stated that Puerto Rico is today the worst case that she has ever studied on the use of uh, the shock doctrine. And in Puerto Rico, there's three, it's a, it's a three headed shock. First, we have the recession since 2008 with the uh, neoliberal austerity changes to regulations, uh, increased profit for, for corporations, public and government job cuts, and abandonment of this infrastructure and maintenance. Then we had the law signed by the Congress, uh, which is called PROMESA, uh, the Political Oversight and Management Board. This was due to first uh, to kind of control corruption locally and uh, extract over $73 billion, US dollars, 
to repay uh, a hedge fund hedge fund um, debt. And uh, the funny thing is that the, this law is called promesa, which in Spanish means promise, but it's not a promise of wealth and and uh, well-being. It's a promise of extraction of, of money to already to an already exhausted economy and, and society. And then comes the hurricane. And, and this has an impact on health, lives, housing, communications, water, electricity, you name it, education, nature, economy, psychological well-being. So this is like the, the three-headed disaster, really. Uh, so it, you can see that it started already before the, the hurricane happened. And then in January, like recently now, January 2020, we received a series of earthquakes on the southern part of the island, which have additionally added to the to the unrest, you know, psychological unrest that we are living here. And of course, uh, since March, globally, we've suffered the, the COVID-19 situation. So it's quite a, a, a hectic atmosphere. Uh, nevertheless, you know, we try to focus more on the on the positive and see how the reconstruction process takes place from the communities uh, and up, so bottom up. Puerto Rico, if I didn't mention it before, is a colony since uh, 19, 1898 with the United States, but before that it had been 400 years of colony under the Spanish rule, Spanish crown. So basically Puerto Rico has never been independent and we have never been able to to make our own decisions. Um, this is a, a, a drawing from, from a local artist, you know, trying to express that even though we have a lot of problems, of issues on the island, everybody was trying to, to make the best of the, you know, uh, putting forward their best skills and capabilities to, to recover from the natural disaster shock, the, the hurricane. And on the other side, the federal government uh, incarnated in, in the president here, uh, trying to do, you know, to support Puerto Rico, but not seeing the real needs of, of our people. And this has been a constant element of uh, the U.S. politics with Puerto Rico is that they take decisions in the Congress without really consulting the people who are concerned about the, the laws that will be implemented. Just j so I've talked a little bit about the, this, the, the food production in Puerto Rico in the past, food, uh, the political situation, no? the political menace, and now I would like to, to focus more on the actual biophysical shock uh, which caused, which was caused by by Hurricane Maria. Uh, this left us in a in a situation that was unknown, unprecedented, and it was urgent to act. Uh, we had first Irma at the beginning of September 2017, so that was the first hurricane, category four out of five, and then we had Maria, category five out of five. So it was a, a double shock. The the islands that were not touched by Irma were affected by Maria afterwards. So there's a bunch of islands that, that were affected by either both, either or the hurricane or some of them uh, both, like um, Barbuda, for instance. And this was the effect, no? Like this was, this picture was before the September 2017 and that was right after the passage of Hurricane Maria. So basically a nuclear bomb. Let me show you another picture to, to check the amount, you know, or the extent of the damage. This is a bridge in the mountains and in, in areas where normally hurricanes don't necessarily go through, uh, infrastructure not ready, a lot, of, a lot of water, a lot of rain, a lot of wind, and uh, the infrastructure to pass from one place to another across the river disappeared completely, no? nuclear bomb. Some of the other effects, this, this is the electric grid. Normally, uh, I mean, in normal time, 
you would see the island at night completely illuminated. And this was, uh, you know, a few weeks after the hurricane, where only San Juan, which is the capital area, has electricity and in some areas and uh, a few of the other main cities, but no, uh, no real access. And particularly, this is something that was very uh, worrying, is that there was no food in the supermarket and in an economy where we import 85% of our food, this is very problematic because the other 15% is not enough that is produced on the island is not enough to, to feed the, the communities. And that's the, the main, the real, well, that's one of the real questions that we have to see is how to promote or how to uh, go further with, with producing our own food. No? And this is something related to, to a political approach which could be re uh, named food sovereignty. Yeah? And along with food sovereignty, we're seeking for electric, uh, electrical sovereignty, energy sovereignty, and, and, and also political sovereignty, which goes along. Another outrageous effect of the hurricane uh, is the number of deaths that were uh, documented the official government numbers right after the hurricane said that only 17 persons died from the or were affected directly from the the hurricane but the estimates go go up to 4 400 4645 persons no these are estimates based on 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 local interviews and statistics because the the effect of the hurricane was not immediate. People did not die because of the winds and the flooding, but mostly uh, in the afterwards, because the infrastructure was so damaged that, for example, elderly people could not uh, access the, the hospital or could not have electricity to to turn on some respiratory machines or, or so so. And that resulted in an excessive amount of deaths compared to the to the year before and that's how they made these estimates but this was already also also outrageous because we we felt abandoned by our own uh, government some of these elements that i'm uh, describing today are written in a chapter that i wrote with nelson alvarez in this in this book maybe we could get it at, at core, um, and it speaks about basically the, these elements that I'm that I'm I have showed you already, and I will show you in, in a while. So, what about the farmers? What about the farms? No, this resistance to climate events, to extreme climate events, I can only show it to you through through some images. Um, this is Hardin Pachamama in, in the farm of, of Maga. She's a, a, a lady farmer. She's been here for, for a couple of years already on this farm. And you can see the before and after no? of, of a forest, really. This is a, a garden forest, which is a, structurally is one of the systems that are most resilient, no? this forest. And still, the, the forest suffered with the, with the hurricane impact no it's landslides flooding the the vegetation was already was uh, decimated burnt so even on, on a even on a on a resilient or you know well structured ecosystem the the hurricane impact was very important this is another farm a seed production farm before and after the vegetation brown This is a urban farm where normally Betsy, the, the lady farmer here, has all of her things outside. Well, the hurricane basically blew some of the infrastructure and, of course, many of the crops. So it was it was uh, challenging to to restore quickly because of the of all the the garbage yeah, that that you can find not only from your own farm, but also from the neighbors, no? All of these projectiles 
that arrive from, from elsewhere, which need to be uh, cleansed up. And um, this, this image on the, on, the, on the right is the effect of flooding. No? Uh, another farm that is on a, on a low land and was flooded after the hurricane, and you can basically do nothing there because the water has, un until the water uh, evaporates, basically. And so this is in the rural area, and the, the image on the left here is in the urban areas where we also have uh, lowlands and communities that are built nearby water. So when there's a, a, a perturbation, this infrastructure are affected and, uh, yeah, they are not the, the richest communities, and that's maybe the reason why they are close to to this water water flood uh, water uh, flood prone areas. And uh, I think there's a there's a reflection to be made here and some actions to be taken in order to safeguard the the communities here and their 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 livelihoods and their families. Um, and yeah, I showed already some images of infrastructure, but these these two are uh, for me quite emblematic. No, this really nice wooden house in a in a in a farm that is not too much impacted. Uh, the the hurricane winds basically blew off both houses, and you can imagine that when you lose your house, you have where to sleep. The psychological uh, issues that arise from that and the consequences in, in productivity, you know, if you're not well rested, if you are not well in your head, it's very difficult for you to, to produce food for the, for the rest of the community. So the, the food sovereignty as well gets affected from, from such an impact. And that, until now I've shown you organic farms or agroecological farms. These are three images of basically industrial farming uh, practices, uh, coffee, plantain, and, and banana. Um, and you can see that monoculture survived even less because they were not, not as protected. In the coffee areas, these landslides, massive landslides, no, no forest protection, no canopy, uh, no biodiversity in the, in the plantain monocultures. And, and, and this, is, this is quite difficult to, to re with, with designs like this, it's quite difficult to resist even uh, hard winds or, or floods and uh, the idea is that it is, we help or support design even in conventional farms, industrial practices, the, to design resilient, you know, re resilient uh, schemes to these extreme events. This is quite the challenge. Now, the hurricane was uh, was a, a big shock. Nonetheless, the landscape recovers quite quickly, and this is amazing. No, this is uh, uh, the the image of a beach before Irma, after Irma, and then uh, a few weeks after after Maria. You can see that the vegetation re recovers uh, relatively quickly. The the coral reef or the the areas in the in the in the water. They suffer a little bit, but they will recover uh, quickly as well. Uh, in the mountains, before the hurricane, after after Hurricane Maria in October, and then in December, you see that already a few weeks afterwards, you already we see the green again. It's it's not as uh, as brown. So this gives us, of course. Um, yeah, I, I forgot the word. This gives hope. us uh, hope. Yes, thank you. Wow, yeah. <laughs> happens sometimes. This gives us hope, of course, and it gives us inspiration to to see how how we can recover from from the farming perspective, no? Um, but the thing is that the, the while while nature recovers quite quickly, societies recover quite slowly. But this is this is exactly what what we are looking at is that how did these communities uh, within the island and 
in the diaspora. So I'm, I'm talking about Puerto Rican communities within Puerto Rico and com Puerto Rican communities or Latino communities in the United, in the United States and in Europe, how uh, the, these persons got organized in order to support what was the, the recovery process and the restoration process. Uh, some of the brigades, uh, even Greenpeace, came to support our, our cause at, at, at some point. Um, a number of NGOs, a number of uh, cooperatives and, and community support initiatives uh, developed and, and actually made the, the change because on the one hand, the government was not really giving the support that was needed. On the other hand, uh, no... Nobody, you know, nobody knows better the needs than the community itself, and and that's exactly what what we were able to document and to see in after the in the aftermath of Maria, that despite the vulnerability, the response capacity of these communities was uh, was countering the the issue. <clears throat> Uh, I'm showing you this picture. Uh, one of the initiatives I, I was involved in and I, I found very interesting is called La Guagua Solidaria, or was called because it, it was very momentous. This uh, this initiative, this project, Guagua Solidaria means the solidary bus, and the idea was to find to finance for uh, two two years a small bus for with capacity for volunteers and materials and tools to go around 200 farms in two years and support whatever whatever the need was. No? Solar panels, uh, farming, uh, weeding, whatever. We had the tools and we had the, the people to, to do it. And I thought this was a very interesting initiative. I participated in a few of these visits and I found them very useful. And one of the few initiatives that uh, made sense both technically, politically, and so socially were quite uh, accepted. Then we also had some other events to support, you know, community em em empowerment um, and, and supporting simultaneous visits to different farms to see what was the experience, not, necess not necessarily showing people how to do or what to do or, or, or what not to do, but actually listening to the farmers that suffered the hurricane uh, to understand how how the the event affected them but also what strategies they took they put in place to to counter the 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 effects the perturbation no? we had a, a number of symposium number of visits which i could talk in in detail uh, maybe another time um, other visits with also uh, professors from, from elsewhere, maybe some of you know Miguel Altieri or Clara Nichols, Yvette Perfecto here, and uh, John Vandermeer. These are some of the people that came, or also Eric Holt Jimenez and Leonora. Uh, they, they came at some point to Puerto Rico to support us, to, to, to support these this, uh, exchanges of knowledge. And also ident help us identify, you know, some of the of the resilient practices, which I think is the basis for 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 reimagining the future. We also had uh, a few uh, exchanges or study trips, no, to with farmers. So we had one to Cuba with five Puerto Ricans and four Haitians going to Cuba for 10 days to explore and, and, and share experiences in, in resilient design, climate change resilient design from the Cubans. The Cubans, you know, are technically very strong in, in developing agroecological farms. Uh, they are well organized as well. And uh, this was a, a, a trip to, to share ideas, basically, to share practices and, and see how we can adapt both in Haiti and Puerto Rico, experiences or practices from, from Cuba. And then the other trip was for a, a, a workshop in agroecological 
uh, design of silvopastoral systems, so agroforestry systems with animals and, and trees. And uh, there was this one farmer from Puerto Rico that, that went for for a week to share experiences and bring back some of the of the of the knowledge. So that was th these these uh, uh, knowledge exchanges were shown or were shared with with the wider community in different symposia. Uh, the last one we had was in December 2019. And this is something recurrent. Every year we do a, a symposium on agroecology, and the idea is that we have the, the 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 big event, the symposium itself, preceded by several several workshops. No, so we had we were sharing this year. We were sharing the the Colombian experience with with Samuel that went to Colombia with the pastoral system, uh, the Cuban experience with the uh, design of and practices of uh, resilient farms to climate change, and then the Puerto Rican experience to anchor it in, in the local uh, with agroforestry and also silvopastoralism. So the idea is to integrate community, to integrate the resources that we already have into sharing the knowledge to redesign these systems. Um, and something that, that is very important I'm going to talk a little bit about theory now. Is that the vulnerability of the of the farming systems or the food systems is normally countered by the capacity that communities have to react and restore the the damage. So that's why I say that social resilience is inherent to these agroecological systems. We, we cannot only have the fruits and and the crops. We we need the people. Um, this is an example of uh, a firm with whom I am collaborating very closely. Uh, after the hurricane, we, we had exchanges with, with some researchers that came to Puerto Rico. Uh, we, the, you know, we deepened, uh, that's the correct word, to, to go further in the, in the understanding of the agroecological principles for resilient design. We modified some things. We did these uh, contour beds, terraces, integrating diversity, going outside of the farm to, to seek information and support with other farmers. And the result is that today, uh, uh, two years after the hurricane, the farm is, is has become a uh, what they what can be known as a agroecological lighthouse no like a, a farm managed by by a couple by two persons which is uh, economically or trying to be economically viable socially very just no with the community and with themselves and also uh, serves as an inspiration for other farms because it is small scale and replicable and uh, of course very low input in external, very low, uh, making very low of external inputs. And I think that's the basis for analysis of social ecological system is that we can break down the metabolic functions of, a, of a, an ecological, social ecological system in three. No? First is the technical productive aspect, which uh, which is like the, the farm itself, like what, what's there, the structure, the, the biodiversity, the connections and social networks and exchanges, and that is uh, how we organize in, in a community. And then these, uh, these two aspects are embedded in the evolutionary history of our territory. So something happens somewhere, is there is a history to that. It's not out of the blue. So. This is what we call the metabolic functions of agroecosystems that González de Molina in Spain uh, wrote down in a paper. And um, the idea is to see after a hurricane or before a hurricane how these different structures bring or can promote resistance and, and recovery, you know, what we call resilience, if we decompose resilience. And, one of the hypotheses is that the more diversity, the more complex these structures, the
the more resistant and and the faster they can they can recover. Of course, this is a, a working hypothesis. I think we will have many lively debates around these 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 issues. But the 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 more simple landscape, then the more vulnerable they can be, right? Uh, in order to to design complex ecosystems, agro ecosystems, uh, the principles of agroecology are are quite uh, in tune with that. No, these are five principles that take di from different disciplines: uh, landscape, biology, systems thinking, anthropology, to to synthesize the principles of design, which are diversity, efficiency synergy recycling and interaction and these principles you can see them in basically any any farming system in the world temperate to tropical but then what changes is the specific farming practices that are taking place in in each area no contextualizing the history the biophysical possibilities and the and the social networks and as a scientist uh, at least from from my personal perspective is that the, the more you integrate communities in the in the research, so the more you participatory research you do on farmer fields and not necessarily on station, then the more uh, the more possibilities there are for for communities to ad, ad, adopt and adapt the the practices that are shared. Now, in terms of how we understand resilience, we have three basic elements to be. Uh, decompose. No, first is the hazard. So let's say the the hurricane itself. How frequently? How intense? How long does it last? Then you have the vulnerability, which is basically the the matrix. No, what is the ecological matrix which we are embedded in? The geographical region, the diversity, the 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 soil quality that we have, the and, and the complexity of this of this matrix. And this vulnerability is countered by the response capacity of the communities, the knowledge that is inherent to the systems and to the, to the recovery process, the management that is taken, the resources available and access, and more importantly, the social organization, which is not, nothing else than, than public policy, no? political organization. Um, and, and I think this equation shows it nicely no like how what is the relation between these three elements here uh, is the risk right we try to assess or to predict what the risk could be after a, a, a perturbation a, a disaster natural or, or political now the question here is which I'm showing this scheme now from from a Cuban uh, researcher Fernando Funes, uh, which side is more at risk when you have a, a hurricane perturbation, you know, and it's very complicated because of course on the on the left side you have less elements for for being at risk. Uh, you, the vulnerability can could be high in terms of drought, yeah, right, but not necessarily too many opportunities on the right side you have many economic opportunities and also uh, a big risk of, of losing uh, in case of uh, of flooding or hurricane winds so the complexity of the landscape comes with the complexity of reflection and analysis to to see to to redesign this this system and And yeah, and the last thing I want to say is that there are many views. No, there's uh, the what we call the pluriverse. Like, no, not everybody has necessarily the same views on the different aspects. So I think that's very important also to take into account. In that, there is not one single way of doing things, especially in the in this climate change resilient design perspective. There are many ways, and in fact, there are many types of agriculture. And that's why I like to talk about agricultures in, in plural because everybody has a uh, their own stake there's nothing written on stone 
And that's basically what we try to develop with Lucas here and with the green shirt, is to identify in Puerto Rico what the pluriverse of our communities are. And so we were, he, and he came to Puerto Rico for three months uh, in October last year, and the idea was to explore the past, present, and future of, of uh, what people understand as food sovereignty in Puerto Rico. And we did this through participatory methods, um, participatory uh, photo taking. He, he found a, a series of uh, disposable cameras and then we passed them to the farm. So we, we had a number of uh, participatory activities to, let's say, characterize this diversity of uh, this di and diverging as well. Uh, aspects to farming and agroecological uh, processes. So he's a student from Wageningen. He's finishing his master's at the moment. And, and as I said, I was, I've been here in Utuado, in Puerto Rico, uh, supporting the, this, this internship. Oh yeah, and this QR code, uh, you could scan it if you want. You can see the series of interviews. Unfortunately, I think they're all in Spanish, but at least it could give you an idea, uh, you know, an idea of the different sounds of the farms here and the tones of the voice of the people, even if you don't understand exactly what they're they're saying. And you can access as well some of the images that were taken. No? So there was a, a dual um, process. On the one hand, Lucas was taking pictures with his uh, analog camera. On the other hand, farmers, uh, eight farmers were taking pictures of what food sovereignty represents uh, for them in the past, pre present, and future. Um, the, the greater objective of this project was to map these experiences, to promote knowledge exchanges, and to support in the transformation of more conventional farms towards agroecological designs and uh, especially reducing the, the number of the, the exposure to agrotoxic practices. So this is like the general scheme. Then what Lucas found is that these are some of, the, of his conclusions, know that agroecology is a, is a, is a political movement, uh, whether we understand it or not, it has a political, it has a, the potential to change and transform societies. Um, According to these this archaeologists that you see here, Reniel Rodriguez, uh, indigenous and, and foreign settlers brought more than just seeds to the Caribbean. They brought plant traditions, knowledge of these plants, of course, and culture that still remain alive in our, in our society. Um, in terms of economical and political relation with the U.S., he says that dependency is control, and that's exactly you know what we're what we're living through a series of of laws, Promesa for one, the Jones Act uh, for another, and, and, and several laws that are controlling our economies. We cannot, for example, commercialize fruits with the Dominican Republic without passing through Florida, which is ridiculous because Dominican Republic is only a few miles away from from us. So things like this, and then. Uh, he was saying also that agroecology, the, the persons involved in agroecology movement should not be counterculture. I want to say hippies, long hair, beard, beards, and, and everything. Um, and we should rather uh, start from what already exists, no? Like, let's see who the farmers are, who the real farmers are, because in, sometimes we position ourselves as uh, countering, whereas we should be more inclusive. That was his, his advice. And this is interesting because after the hurricane, of course, the mainstream did not necessarily see uh, uh, food production as an important aspect, whereas in the agriculture movement, this was the, the most crucial aspect. Um, insights from el elderly farmers with uh, these interviews with Lucas was that communities were more were 
are sensed as more productive in the past because each household had traditionally traditionally a vegetable garden what we call here in our local native language conuco um, and these these uh, households were more resilient to perturbations this is uh, interesting no in the past everything was better and if it was then what what can we learn i think that's that's the way forward um yeah and he also states that slowly slowly the traditions are are disappearing which is which is sad and we are trying to rescue that um another lady farmer dominga is where some of her conclusions is that there is a need to resist against the destruction of nature which is why we we have we are engaged in uh agroecological farming which is non-destructive in a way um that knowing our past we can better design the future and that the combination between different uh, ages different uh, knowledge bodies can create something better and i think that's where where our ecology can can support the or can can be this uh, con con can concretely be the combination of, of all of these uh, elements and um, one last image from the work of Lucas is this bull, right? This picture was taken by Augusto with the disposable camera. Augusto is a farmer from the Central Mountains. And at first, when we saw this picture, we only saw a bull, right? A traditional animal from the farm. But then when we had the interview with Augusto, uh, him showing us the picture, uh, we realized that we were completely out of focus with only a bull. It's not only a bull, it is the bull. It is uh, a specific race that is very well adapted to these tropical uh, mountain conditions and that he is rescuing because the tradition has uh, uh, is going down. And um, this animal has a triple purpose so of course the the meat and the milk which are the traditional uses or functions for for this type of livestock and also the tilling no the soil the preparation of 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 soil uh, for for cropping so it has a triple purpose and it's a variety of, of bull arrays that has been on the island for more than 400 years and he's rescuing the seeds of these uh, types of, of animals. And I think this is very important because, as the as uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, the settlers and the indigenous people not only brought the seeds or the <coughs> races of animals, they also brought the knowledge with that and the way of of managing that. And and for for us, this was. This picture, even though it doesn't show any damage from the hurricane or any, um, uh, you know, redesign or reimagining of, of the for the for the future, uh, it represents tradition and the rescuing of, of it. So I think that's important also to take into account, and not only from what was the damage, but also what have we gained. And I think after the hurricane, many people realized that. We have uh, a lot of potential. We have things going on, and I think, and those are the things we need to promote rather than promote the the damage or the negative aspects. And, I, and this is something that gives us uh, power as as a society, not only locally but also uh, globally. And I would just like to finalize my presentation for today and maybe maybe there are many open loops still but the what the idea was to to show an overview of of what we what the what we have soft what we have endured here in, in on the island but then I, I would like to finish to wrap up with the colleagues here uh, present already uh, in, in how, from a researcher's perspective, how could we uh, promote food sovereignty and uh, resilience of 
farming communities in general, whether it's in Puerto Rico or elsewhere. This is a, a proposal that I'm throwing here publicly with you. Is this research pro proposal on Caribbean agroecology resilience. No? And the idea would be to characterize vulnerability and response capacity to extreme events in the region. And uh, with three main, or let's say at least three driving questions, how do these natural ecosystems mimic, uh, how do, you do these farming systems, sorry, mimic natural ecosystems? How do people organize what the social networks and uh, what knowledge is shared between farmers and also with teachers. So if if somebody is interested, I would be keen on, on discussing this further and seeing how we can we could collaborate, fund it and and make it happen. And um, and yeah. These are so I, I'll be joining CORE in August, and these are some of the networks that I bring with me. Uh, Cultivate, that you, maybe some of you know, SOCLA, which is the Scientific Society for Agroecology, Latin America. CELIA is another center in agroecology. Uh, Via Campesina Boricua is a local organization here. And of course, the universities in Puerto Rico that I plan on, on bringing on board to collaborate with with uh, with uh, persons from from core, so I hope you liked my presentation, and I look forward to to hearing from you and collaborating in the near future.